New product introductions. We do these every week. Thank you, DigiKey, for making this segment possible. STM, Big Data, what is IMPI this week? Okay, this IMPI is actually uh, thanks to Scott, who does, who's our lead developer, one of our lead developers on CircuitPython, who's like, hey, did you know about these really cool STM32 chips? They're called the STM32U5. Wow. Uh, and I was like, no, I don't know about them. But I checked it out and DigiKey did, in fact, uh, feature them. So I thought, hey, this would be a you know good time for me to research this chip uh, and also tell you all about it. Because I think uh, STM32 chips are available nowadays. The prices are back to reasonable levels. The stocking is pretty good. Uh, so it's an excellent time if you want to integrate a powerful new chip to check out uh, the U5 series. Uh, so the U5 series, you know, it's... STM32s, we know them, you know, they're ARM Cortex chips, they have a lot of peripherals, um, use uh, STM32 cube to do development, um, you know, they're they're very popular, and so most folks have tried or used an STM32 chip uh, sometime in their life. This new series um, updates, you know, that a lot of chips that people use with the Cortex M0, M3, or M4 series, maybe people use the M7s. Uh, the uh, STM32 H7 or F7 series. This is the M33. So the M33 is uh, the latest model of Cortex. Uh, these don't have as high clock rate, but they do have some really nice peripherals and capabilities. Um, in specific, the thing that really um, made my eyes pop is the three megabytes of SRAM. I think Scott also was like, that's a lot of SRAM. And they have a lot of SRAM, uh, mostly for their display stuff, although uh, and we should talk about, but um, if you just need a microcontroller with a ton of onboard chip, not external PS RAM or DRAM, this uh, is definitely the most I've ever seen. Uh, so the U5 series is uh, featured as uh, ultra low power. It's kind of what the U stands for. It is very, very low power, but and it also has um, embedded crypto uh, built in. But the real thing that it's great for is the graphic support. This is some of the strongest graphic supporting microcontrollers. Basically, you're getting microprocessor level video graphic support at microcontroller pricing and integration complexity. Uh, so this is the entire family. Um, in specific, I'm kind of the most interested, you know, if I had to pick one, uh, the STM32U599 um, series is kind of seems to be like a nice middle. Uh, it doesn't have the crypto. If you need crypto, just you'll know, bump up to the uh, U589, but it does have TFT display IO support. Uh, it comes, you know, it's a, a BGA, but it at least comes in a 0.4 millimeter pitch. There are, um, oh, sorry, and also the, um, it does come in, um, QFP, uh, 100 pin QFP and 144 QFP, um, as well as, uh, BGA as well, um, d different packages. Sorry, it's the, it's the middle line. And, um, you can get it with up to two and a half K of built-in RAM and four megabytes of flash. The interesting thing I thought with the 599 series is the Neochrome G GPU, uh, that is built into this series. And this is basically an upgrade from the Chrome Art, which is the previous family. Um, the Neochrome GPU basically adds um, advanced scaling, texture mapping, um, has some hardware and JPEG decoding as well, and uh, DSi display support. So, you know, pretty much every um, STM chip from like the Cortex M0, you know, F. 013 or whatever, F103 series up to the H7 can control SPI or parallel 8080 or 6800 displays. Um, these are displays that have a built in frame buffer, and you draw a window and you say, you know, I want to fill the rectangle from 00 to 200 by 400 or whatever, and then you blit out the uh, uh, data over SPI or parallel 8 bit. And then the display handles the continuous updating of the TFT from the built-in frame buffer. The only thing is um, these tend to be small. So, you know, SPI TFT displays you know, like 60, 64 by 48 pixels up to maybe 320 by 240. Um, parallel displays, you know, 480 by 320 or maybe 640 by 480 at the max um, are possible, but you are limited because the interface just isn't that fast. Usually it's like 10 megahertz. Maybe you overclock to 20. You just can't write that many pixels that fast. 
Um, so the next thing you could possibly do is update to a dot clock display. And um, we've recently been playing more dot clock displays. You need a lot of pins for these, but you can control displays up to like 800 by 680. Um, these are very common for, uh, you know, white goods, uh, in-car entertainment systems, um, you know, checkout kiosks and stuff. You'll see small displays that are on like the you know, the credit card machines or whatever. Those are often going to be RGB TTL displays. Uh, you can get fairly good resolution, but the downside is you have to have a ton of pins because uh, you need 24 pins for the color because you need one pin for every color. So eight red, eight green, eight blue, H-Sync, V-Sync, data enabled clock, and then you also need, you know, backlight control and stuff. So easily, uh, you know, up to 30 wires. That's a lot of wires. It also makes your routing annoying. Um, and also there is a max, like you do eventually hit a max. So I'm usually about like, I think like 800 by 800. I haven't really seen DPI displays, uh, you know, RGB TTL displays that are larger than that. And you do need to have a hardware interface just because you're, there's no built-in memory on the displays. You're constantly blitting out the pixel data to the display. So DSI, which you people may be familiar because it's on like a Raspberry Pi computer and other single board computers, is a differential signal protocol. It's kind of similar to HDMI in that way. Um, you only need two to six pins because you need two clock pins and a differential and then one or two lanes uh, to control fairly large displays. You're still, you know, blitting out the data continuously, but because it's differential, you can go much, much faster uh, compared to uh, the limitations of the, the RGB TTL, which is, you know, maybe 40 megahertz or so. Um, with a DSI display, it's usually a little lower voltage and it's differential, um, so it's designed to go very, very fast. And you can blit uh, the data, but you do need to have, you can see up to one gigabit per second, crazy fast, but you do need to have um, hardware support. You know, a lot of cool displays we're seeing these days. This is in particular is RGB TTL, but a lot of these displays these days are available, the 30 pin MIPI DSI interface. And so if you don't want to wire up you know, dozens of pins, and you want full 24 bit color you see here this is 16 bit color you see that there's the great it's not a solid gradient you see the uh, especially the pink and the blue because that there's more there's six green pixels and only five red and five blue you'll see uh stippling there um between the gradient and then you see as it gets to green it gets smoother and then back to blue and pink um you start to see the lines again because uh it's not 24 bit color because not a lot of chips have that many pins, but again, with DSI, you don't need that many pins. It can be kind of nice. So um, for the display, the microcontrollers that support DSI host, it's not usual. It's quite rare. And historically, it's only been kind of the F7, H7 line have been pretty popular. Um, the F469 does, but it only has, you know, 350K of on-chip SRAM. And you could connect external RAM, but like now, like your cost and complexity is going up quite a bit. Uh, what I really like about the 599 series, like I said, it's got two-ish megabytes of SRAM, which means that you could have a double buffer of an 800 by 800 pixel display at 16-bit color um, and still have, you know, a megabyte left over for whatever interfacing you wanted or whatever data you're manipulating, uh, you know, texture handling or objects or so. So, you know, you really do need quite, it, the, the pixels add up fast because it's like two, maybe three bytes per pixel um you know so it's uh it's kind of nice to see that they've bumped from the h7 f7 series from half or one meg up to two and a half so you don't have to do that external uh sd ram uh wiring uh so this is the family so you know the earlier ones don't have the neochrome gpu uh only kind of the bigger ones do the earlier ones also only have like 250 or a paltry 750k of uh sram but they do get up to three megabytes which is quite nice they also have, of course, all the peripherals that you'd expect, SPI, UART, I squared C, et cetera, et cetera, tons of them, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, once you get past the, uh, you know, 5.9 series, you get high-speed USB as well, which is quite nice. Um, and then, of course, half of them have crypto and half of them don't. If you don't need the crypto, you know, don't pay for it. Also, you know, maybe there's uh, compliance issues that you have to deal with. Um, Another nice thing is it looks like it's some of the more recent chips they have JPEG hardware decoding, which is great because if you want to play videos, um, you know, having a full uh, MP4 decoder is usually, you know, you have to pay licensing fees maybe, or it's computationally expensive, you need specialized hardware, but 
MJPEG is easily uh, implemented in hardware, and then you can stream animations. Maybe they're not like super, super high res, but for, you know, white goods, if you want to have just animations of like how to use the device, startup screens, etc. cetera, uh, MJ, MJPEG is plenty good, and it looks like they do, uh, you know, DirectX type stuff as well. Also vector fonts and vector graphics. Uh, looks like the latest versions of these chips also have some vector support, which is great. Saves you a lot of flash because you don't have to store, you know, full fonts of every size, um, which is quite lovely. So a lot of uh, improvements and you know, implement, uh, iterations on the touch GFX and, um, uh, you know, graphics support system for STM32. They also have dev kits with displays built in and best of all, they're in stock. Double digit You can actually buy these chips. Yeah. So they're available. Uh, let's pick them up. Different packages. I just picked this one in particular. But again, like I said, there's BGA, TQFP, uh, 64, 100, 144. Uh, pick the smallest one you can get to. I like that they have TQFP because I know sometimes nice fancy chips don't come in anything but bga and it can make your board layout complicated but if you don't need external sram and you're using dsi you might actually be able to get away with like a four layer board uh with full graphics display so where normally you might have been like oh i need to go with you know a microprocessor that's running linux you could probably do with a microcontroller okay and in context of this since i'll get the question in real time when referring to a crypto chip is it the Wi-Fi connection USB um, code itself. So the crypto is often used for chip security. So you know if you have data that you're sending over IoT, yes, for uh, like if there's a, you're using bare SSL for example, um, crypto engine will often help speed that up. Um, or if you have data on external flash chip that you want to read and and immediately uh, decrypt on the fly, um, that's another situation where you might have a crypto chip uh, hardware support. Okay. And we're going to play a video and we'll see you on the other side. Okay. Yeah.